Good afternoon. This is Elise Gross, and today we'll be speaking about incapacity planning documents. Before we get started, if anyone has any questions during the course of the webinar, please email them to info at assetprotectionattorneys.com. I'll try to get to them, but if not, I will respond to them via email. Just trying to see, I have an echo. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, I've been an attorney for over 25 years in the South Florida area. My practice concentrates on estate planning and asset protection. We do give complimentary preliminary consultations. If you have any issues with asset protection or estate planning, you can call in to the firm or email us. And we have a weekly newsletter. It's an e-newsletter. So if you're not already receiving it, then please email us and we'd be happy to put you back on the email list for the newsletter. I'm going to try, if anybody cannot hear me, um, please let me know. Sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of an echo. This is what happens when you're working during COVID from home. I apologize. just waiting for verification that I can be heard. Okay, so we're going to have to do with the echo, I apologize. All right, today we're going to be talking about estate planning in capacity documents. And during this time of COVID, it is critical that everybody understand what all this means and what incapacity documents are all about. Obviously, life is very uncertain, and we've all learned this right now in these very trying times. So what I want to do is concentrate today not really on general estate planning, although I'll tell you a little bit about that, but what I want to concentrate on is um, on the incapacity documents. Here, the slideshow is not moving. Okay, so what we're talking about today is incapacity planning, why you need these documents, who would you choose to be your representative. We'll talk about the different documents themselves, and we'll touch a little bit upon insurance with regard to incapacity. So what is incapacity all about? Well, we have to start with the concept of estate planning. So what is estate planning? Estate planning is the process that you go through to prepare documents and to essentially sit your, situate yourself in a position where should you become incapacitated or upon your death, what's going to happen to you, to your finances, to your children, what happens to your business, and essentially, who is going to be in charge of managing these things? So estate planning is a very broad concept. And again, today we're going to narrow it down and just speak mostly about what it means when you're incapacitated or someone else is incapacitated and maybe you're the person in charge. So let's keep our focus narrowed today, and we'll talk about just the incapacity. Incapacity doesn't have to mean that you've gone through a court process and been declared incapacitated. So there's two types. There's either the judicially declared incapacity, or there's just the concept of the person is no longer able to manage all of their affairs or be able to make health care decisions. So let's go through a minute or so on what it means to become officially incapacitated under a court of law. So what happens there is if a person is no longer able to manage their own affairs and they are not either not making good decisions or they are completely not able to communicate because they're in a coma or you know they're in a very bad med, um, physical or mental state, then somehow somebody has to be able to handle things for them. 
if you have the documents that we're going to be speaking about today, then the chances are pretty small that you won't have to go through the court process. And you'll be able to save yourself a lot of time, money, aggravation, dignity. But if you did have to go through the process because either you don't have those documents or because the documents themselves are not enough to get you where you need to go, then you have to go through this court proceeding and it's a guardianship. That guardianship would have to be governed by the court. There are documents that have to be filled out. There are applications. People have to go through fingerprinting and background checks before they can become a guardian. And then once they become your guardian, the court essentially monitors all their activities. So there's the good part about the guardianship is that there is a court oversight, which means that when somebody is in charge of you and in charge of your money, chances of them doing something wrong are less likely because they're going to have to account to the court. So that's the court appointed guardian. So that's when you go through a judicial process. It does cost a lot of money. There are annual fees involved. There are lawyers involved. And to me, the worst part of it is that it means that the person who's incapacitated has to be essentially paraded through a whole court process of evaluations by doctors and social workers and psychiatrists and the court to determine that they're incapacitated and then their rights are really legally stripped away from them. Could be right to vote, right to make a will, right to make any decisions to contract. So obviously your goal would be to avoid that process if at all possible. So that's why you need incapacity planning. We want to avoid having to go to court and being declared officially incapacitated by a court. So there's some statistics here. Um, you know, dementia is on the rise, Alzheimer's on the rise. We all hope and pray that there'll be a cure. But for right now, you know, there's only things that, you know, put off the inevitable. In addition to that, many people become physically disabled or some people just are, you know, as they get older, are just unable to make their own decisions, to make rational, good decisions. I live in Florida and South Florida specifically. We have a lot of elderly. And unfortunately, there are people that prey on the elderly. And sometimes, you know, you're, they're, the elderly's children are not local and can't really monitor the situation. And what will happen is people will knock on their door or call, their, call them on the phone and sell them things. And they get into these long contracts that are just egregious. And they probably shouldn't have had the authority to be able to sign a contract. So sometimes it's better to invoke the, estate, the incapacity documents earlier rather than later before major blunders are made and contracts are signed and, you know, the elderly get themselves involved in contracts that they can't get out of. So by creating these documents that we're going to be talking about, you'll usually be able to keep out of the court and protect the person from their own mistakes as well as from people preying on them. And actually, I'm going to skip one ahead because I just want to run through what these documents are before I start talking about who the representatives are. I don't know why I put it in that order. So the first document that we're going to be talking about, and every one of them we'll talk about in depth, but the first document is the durable power of attorney, which is regarding financial matters. Who makes financial decisions for you? Who's able to sign your checks, sign contracts for you um, if you are incapacitated and unable to do that? Healthcare surrogate is who makes healthcare decisions for you. HIPAA, we've all signed the HIPAA. Um, that's just basically a form that when I do the documents, I just include everybody who you name for any purpose on the HIPAA so that they have the ability to be able to access medical information and other private information that's protected under HIPAA and to be able to speak with people on your behalf. The Declaration of Pre-Need Guardian, that is a form that says in the event that you do need to be declared officially incapacitated by a court, you get to choose that guardian. The living will is 
if you are no longer able to communicate or make your decisions and your medical professionals have declared that there's essentially no hope for your continued um, existence in any proper um, good state of you know good health and quality of life, then you'd be saying in that living will that you don't want extra measures taken to keep you alive when you're going to have absolutely no quality of life. A revocable trust is the document that says, um, I want my assets to be, I'm going to put my assets in a trust, so I'm going to avoid probate when I die. And if I become incapacitated during life, my successor trustee is going to take over and take care of me through the trust assets. And the irrevocable trust, which we're not really going to be talking so much about today, I'm just going to touch upon it. The irrevocable trust might be used for when you know someone is um, incapacitated or disabled in advance, like a special needs beneficiary who might be receiving um, governmental benefits, you may want to create an irrevocable trust for their benefit. There are other irrevocable trust uses, but that's for incapacity, that's pretty much you know, the one that we talk about. So going back to who you choose in terms of um, people that are in charge under all these documents, you're going to want to look at the individual powers that are going to be granted by the documents, whether it's the power of attorney, you're going to be granted powers over money and assets, and in the health care, obviously over your health and your physical well-being. So you're going to evaluate whether or not you want to have a family member or a friend. Your best bet is always just to look at it from the perspective of who would make the best decisions that would make decisions that are similar to what you would make. There's no way to guarantee somebody is going to think exactly like you. But if you have like-minded people, then chances are they will think most like you and will try to envision how you would react and how you would behave under certain circumstances. It might be family. It may be friends. It could even be, you know, in medical. I've seen people name their doctor. Uh, it's usually, though, somebody that's close to them, whether it's a family member or a friend. It can vary by state what the restrictions are. So, for instance, in Florida, the guardianship requirements are that your person you name as guardian and the person who can be appointed must either be a relative or it has to be someone living in the state of Florida. So a relative can be outside the state of Florida, but the, if you choose a friend, your friend would have to be a Florida resident. This is so the court could have jurisdiction over that person. And the court wants to make sure that you know, your well-being is taken care of, so they figure a family member can live anywhere, but they're going to restrict friends to being inside the state of Florida. You could even choose multiple people to serve. It doesn't have to be a single person. However, what you need to keep in mind is that if you choose more than one person to act at a time, it, on a practical level, it makes it a little more difficult. It's, it's not awful, especially now with email and with DocuSign and all of that kind of stuff, but it does require multiple signatures if you choose the people to act unanimously, and you can have conflict. So you have to think carefully before you name multiple people, but I have plenty of clients who do name you know, multiple children for power of attorney for health care. Just understand that sometimes there will be, they will have to narrow it down to one spokesperson, per se, or one authorized person to act. So for instance, I know some of the brokerage houses will say that if you have multiple people acting as power of attorney, they all have to consent to one of them being the representative of all of them to deal with the brokerage house. The reason being, the brokerage house doesn't want to take liability for not getting the consent of every person who's named as an agent under a power of attorney for actions taken on behalf of whatever the account is. So 
from the practical level, it makes it a little more complicated, but it's a good checks and balances system. This way, you know, there's not one person who's in charge of everything. You know, they have to bounce things off of each other. But the bottom line is, you know, it's, it's I don't know if I really need to say it. It's obvious, but you have to choose someone you're going to trust because they are essentially, in my opinion, being given a license to take over your life. Which leads us to one of the biggest and most important documents, but really the one that has the most power for somebody to really mess you up. So the durable power of attorney is a document that says you, we call you the principal, is appointing someone called an agent or a power of attorney or attorney in fact or a donee, there's lots of different names to be able to act on your behalf. They would essentially be able to handle any and all financial matters that you can handle. Now, you can limit that power or you can keep that power broad. The majority of the powers of attorney are very broad, which means that what I can do, you can do for me. So that does give somebody a tremendous amount of power. And I always tell people, you know, you have to be very cautious who you put in this position. And sometimes that kind of scares people off and they say, you know, maybe I don't want a power of attorney. The problem is that if you have the power of attorney and you become incapacitated, your chances of needing a guardianship are reduced dramatically. If you don't have the power of attorney, chances of needing a guardianship are going to be much higher. So you're going to have to decide, am I willing to trust somebody? And if so, it's a better choice to have this durable power of attorney. The word durable, because a power, you can have a power of attorney that's just a general power of attorney that's not durable. But that general power of attorney, the minute you actually become incapacitated, will no longer be a viable document. So what you should be saying to yourself is, well, wait a minute. Why would I want a power of attorney other than when I'm incapacitated? Isn't that the whole point of it? The answer is, in general, yes. But sometimes in business, somebody might do a power of attorney that's non-durable so that they know they can monitor what's going on, and if they did become incapacitated, they wouldn't want this other person to be able to um, handle anything without court order. So that's when you would do a non-durable power of attorney. The durable power of attorney says, even if I become incapacitated, this power of attorney continues to be in effect. That's what the word durable means, and it's really just a one sentence that goes into the power of attorney that says that, and it makes it durable. I rarely see a power of attorney that is not durable, but occasionally in business I will see a non-durable power of attorney. For our purposes, for incapacity planning, the durable power of attorney is the way to go. Most durable powers of attorney are essentially the same. They outline very broad powers that the agent is able to do on behalf of the principal. However, in Florida at least, we have what's called superpowers. And the reason we have superpowers, and I'll tell you what most of those are in a moment, is because in about 2010, Florida changed its law. It used to be that you could sign your power of attorney today while you were fine, and that power of attorney did not kick in until you became incapacitated, until a doctor or two would say, you're no longer able to handle your financial affairs for whatever reason, then you would be incapacitated. Not necessarily declared by a court of law, but one or two doctors would say it and put it in writing, and that would be enough to invoke the power of attorney. And for most of us, we're probably thinking, well, this makes sense. I don't need it today. I only need it if I become incapacitated. Well, they changed the law in Florida in 2010, and 
some states have changed it and some states haven't. So now, when you sign your durable power of attorney, it's effective from the moment you sign it. So that means if I signed one today and named someone as my agent, they could go tomorrow and open up a bank account in my name. They could really, in theory, go to the bank and get my money out of my account and put it in an account in their name as power of attorney for me. So when I told you earlier you're kind of giving a license to steal, you are, which is why it is absolutely imperative to choose the right person to be this agent. So this person is now going to have, from day one, really the same power. In order to safeguard, because I do think it's very important to have the document in place, I always say don't give out any copies of the durable power of attorney. Keep it close to the vest. No copies, because the copy is as good as an original in most cases. You can tell whoever you've named, I've done my documents. In case of emergency, here's where you can find it or here's here so you can contact. Some attorneys will keep all copies of the document. But I would absolutely not give out a copy of this power of attorney to anyone because they can use it immediately. Most of the times you're appointing somebody who's very close to you, like your spouse or a trusted child, so it, there's not much of a worry. But again, I'm more of a realist. I like to make sure that you know people are educated and you need to understand, since it does kick in immediately, you want to make sure that you're not giving it out to the wrong people. Also, if you decide to change your power of attorney, who you're naming, if you've given it out, you then have to go get those documents back and explain why you changed it. This way, you can just rip it up and put a new one in place. Okay, so that's the good and the bad of the power of attorney. Because Florida specifically instituted this new rule that the power of attorney is effective immediately, they then said we need to carve out certain powers that tend to be most abused, and only if the person signing it initials those powers will those powers be included. But otherwise, everything else is included. So some examples of those would be um, to create a trust for you or to change your trust or to use your money to make gifts to spouse, family, and charity, to change beneficiaries. There's a few more, but those are, the, those are the main ones. And those are called superpowers. So when I do my document, there's a list of eight superpowers. And I go over with my clients, here are these specific things. And we decide which ones they're going to initial so that when the witnesses come in, they initial only the ones that they're comfortable with. And I will tell you, some clients initial all, some initial, some initial none, and others, you know, initial one or two. I think there's somebody who might be unmuted if they can mute themselves. Um, okay, moving on to the healthcare surrogate. The healthcare surrogate is a document that basically covers if you can't make healthcare decisions, who's going to make those decisions for you? Who's going to talk to the doctors and make sure that you're getting proper treatment and that your needs are, are being taken care of and you're getting the proper medicines and the proper care? The healthcare surrogate, unlike the power of attorney, is able to kick in either immediately or upon your incapacity. So you have more flexibility there. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, okay, well, why would I want my health care surrogate to kick in now? I'm perfectly fine. Well, the way the health care surrogate is designed, it doesn't mean that a person can make health care decisions for you just because you make it effective today. It just gives the doctors the ability to confer with those people, with your, your surrogate or your proxy, whoever you Some 
somebody in the background here. Just make sure everybody's muted. Um, so we have the flexibility. You can say, all right, I'd like the health surrogate to be effective immediately. And that just allows somebody to, you know, cooperate in the medical decisions and talking to the doctors. Regardless of that, your opinion, as long as you have capacity, your judgment will govern. So the person cannot override your medical decision if you are well. Now, if there's a question as to whether or not you're, you know, mentally capable of making those decisions, then having given somebody that power right away, you know, could be a conflict. So you might want to think about that. Um, most of my clients don't have it be effective immediately, but again, it depends on the relationship of who you're naming. If you're naming your spouse very often, they will have it effective immediately. So with the healthcare, the important thing there is, especially in light of what's going on right now with COVID, you need to be able, if you're a healthcare surrogate for somebody, that gives you the ability to talk to the doctors. Suppose you have, God forbid, you have an elderly parent who's in a hospital or in a nursing home, and now everybody is social distancing and you can't get in, you can't even get in to see them, how are decisions going to be made? How are you even going to be talking to the doctors? So this is just something that you should have always had, but right now it's really bringing to the forefront how important it is to have these documents. Now, the same healthcare surrogate is going to be the one who um, basically invokes the living will, if somebody has a living will, which we'll talk about shortly, and makes the decision, the ultimate decision, about whether or not to take somebody off life support and things of that nature. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty important position. Um, it should be, obviously, somebody you trust. But what I tell people when they're trying to make the decision of who to choose for a healthcare surrogate is look at it from the perspective of the person who's going to have to make those decisions. Does that person make good rational decisions in general? Will that person be susceptible to the bullying from the rest of the family? Will they be able to absorb the medical information that they're being given to be able to make proper decisions? So don't look at, well, who's my oldest child? Don't look at things in age order, because to me, that doesn't make sense. I know a lot of people find if they don't do it that way, then their children get offended. But this is about you, not about them. You should really worry about who's going to make the best decision. And maybe it's not a family member. Maybe it's a friend who's a doctor or a nurse. You've got to decide who's going to make proper decisions for you, because you're alive. And it could be up to them to keep you alive if you're not able to make those decisions for yourself. So I would always be looking at, you know, the long term on this, who is going to make the best medical decisions. And I could tell you the person who makes the best medical decisions may not be the same person who makes the best financial decisions. You're not locked into one person to name for everything. The HIPAA, I won't spend much time on this. Basically, the HIPAA is just the ability for somebody to be able to get your medical records, get information from your doctor, get access to the information um, from the insurance company, all the things that are necessary to be able to um, take care of your health care and your financial matters. So you really need to make sure that whoever you're naming is your agent under the power of attorney, as well as whoever you name as your surrogate under the health care surrogate are all named on this HIPAA, so that they all have the ability to access the information. Declaration of pre-need guardian. So we talked a little bit about this when we talked about guardianship. So guardianship is that court process that I told you about in order to get somebody legally declared incapacitated, which means that their rights are officially revoked or taken away, at least suspended, depending on how long the incapacity is going to last. The guardian is going to have to account for the co to the court each year. If they're guardian over your money, over your property, then they have to tell the court what money came in, where did it come from, what money was spent. 
They usually have to have a court order before they can spend any money. So that means in order to pay for, um, you know, for clothes or for food or for whatever it is, they're going to have to have a court order each time or a standing court order that they get at the beginning of the guardianship or once a year for regular expenses that they know about. If they're guardian of, the, of your person for you, then they're in charge of where you live, who you socialize with, making sure you're fed and you're clothed and, you know, everything that is needed to take care of you personally. And they also will have to account to the court each year by a report and answer a whole bunch of different status questions that the court asks regarding your care. So it is, you know, the guardianship is a, is a process. It's expensive. It takes time. It requires an attorney. But, again, it's a little checks and balances system where the court is overseeing and making sure that at least somebody is really looking out for your best interests. Whereas with a durable power of attorney and healthcare surrogate, it's a matter of trust because there's no court overseeing that situation. So the declaration naming prenatal guardian essentially says, if I do become incapacitated to a point where a court has to intervene and appoint a guardian for me, here's who I would like to choose. And as I said earlier, that guardian under Florida law needs to be either a relative living anywhere or a Florida resident. The living will is a document that not everyone is comfortable with. It basically says, if I'm no longer able to communicate my decisions, whether it's by a mental or physical incapacity, then I want it known to the world that I do not want life prolonging measures taken to keep me alive when I'm going to have no quality of life. So when a person is in a vegetative state, well, that one is fairly cut and dry. But let's just say you're in a coma and while you're in a coma, they find cancer. But the doctors feel that you have very little brain activity. So there's a very, very minor chance that you could come out of this coma and, and have back your brain function. But do they treat the cancer or do they no, not treat the cancer? Um, do you go through chemo and radiation when you're in a coma and the doctor said your, your, your brain has very little function? Those are the types of things that people don't like to think about but that could come up. So you want to think about whether or not you want the living will. And you can leave the living will very generic and just say, I don't want life prolonging measures taken, but I'm leaving my healthcare surrogate in charge of deciding what those are. Or you can be extremely specific and you could say, um, I do want pain management. I don't want blood transfusions. I don't want antibiotics. I don't want um, chemotherapy and radiation. So you it's really up to you how you want to do it. Um, you can also leave your surrogate in charge of the organ donation. Do you want your organs donated? If you don't have a preference, then say nothing. But if you do have a preference, then it's a good idea to put it in your documents. But as I always tell people, the reality is if you truly want to be an organ donor, you should register as an organ donor. And when you register as an organ donor, then um, it's in the system. And then, honestly, whether your family wants you to be an organ donor or not, it's irrelevant because um, your, your pre-registration as an organ donor is going to govern. So with regard to that living will, you can Keep it broad. You can be specific however you want to do it. I always look at it as it's almost lifting an emotional burden from your family by giving them this permission to withdraw life support. So if you're in a situation where there's really no chance and the doctors are saying they should pull the plug, it's a horrible decision for a family to have to make. And ultimately, they're going to have to be the ones that say, okay, do it. But if you release them from the 
conflict of would you want this or not, I think it's a great gift. So I think the living will is very important. With that said, there are religious implications that need to be looked at. So if you're going to do a living will and you happen to be a religious person, you want to make sure that it's going to coincide with your religious beliefs. So whether you're Jewish and you consider doing what we call a halachic living will, which is a little bit more restrictive than your general living will, which requires a rabbi to be consulted over most of the decisions, uh, which means that not life support cannot always be withdrawn and certain care may not be able to be withheld. Um, you know, if, if that's important to you, then you should do that. There are other religions where there are restrictions, like Jehovah's Witnesses, I know, don't do blood transfusions. So there, there are different implications which you should definitely look at before you sign that living will. If it's important to you, it may not be important to you. A revocable trust is also a very important document to do for incapacity planning. While the revocable trust, the biggest advantage of the revocable trust are after death to avoid probate and to make sure that any money that's going to your beneficiaries is done in a way that suits you best, meaning whether it's delayed and kept in trust or um, whether it's given outright at, at certain ages. There's lots of different things you can do with a revocable trust. We're not going to go into all of them today. Today I want to talk about how it relates to incapacity. And it relates to incapacity because a revocable trust is a document you create for your own benefit and you control. So you control as trustee all the assets that are in the revocable trust. You get to benefit from them. It's all well and good. If you become incapacitated, then you should no longer be managing those assets, but you want to make sure that those assets are used for your care. So the successor trustee under your revocable trust steps in to do just that, to take care of you through the trust assets. And it's even easier than using a power of attorney, and it's certainly easier than guardianship. So you can create this trust for your benefit while you're fine. It's no problem. You can make any changes to it. You can run everything through the trust, manage everything. But it's a fairly seamless process should you no longer be able to do that your successor trustee who you've named in your document can just step into your place, take over as trustee, and continue using the money in the trust for your benefit. So I really like the revocable trust as part of an incapacity planning, not just as a tool for planning things for after your death. The irrevocable trust, I'll touch on very briefly, because the irrevocable trust is really more of an estate planning tool and an asset protection tool. It's a trust where once you transfer assets in it and create this trust, you no longer generally derive any benefit or control over. So from an incapacity standpoint, it really doesn't help you particularly. Where it comes into play is if you have any beneficiaries, any children, siblings who you might consider giving money to that are either receiving or potentially receiving governmental benefits like social like um, social security income, SSI, or Medicaid, then they can't own any assets. So you don't ever want to leave them any assets because then they could lose their government benefits. So you could set up a special needs trust for their benefit and that special needs trust could help take care of them while they are, in fact, incapacitated and disabled. But it only pays for certain things that the government does not. So there are very strict rules for special needs trusts. Um, you could actually set one up for yourself called a first party special needs trust. Um, if you feel that, you know, if you're going to be receiving government benefits or if you are currently receiving benefits, there's a difference between the first party and one that's set up a third party set up by others. There are different rules. There are different payback rules. Again, kind of beyond the scope of today. But I can see where the special needs trust is really a tool for incapacity as well as just for leaving benefits to somebody 
who is otherwise incapacitated and receiving government benefits. Last thing I want to touch on is what types of insurances should you be looking at having in case you become incapacitated? Like the most important insurance most people think of from an estate planning standpoint is life insurance. If I die, here's some money that's going to help take care of my family. And you can do term life insurance, so it, you know, it's generally cheaper, but it expires after a certain period of time, so you keep paying for it, but once the term's over, chances are you're not renewing it because the price will go up tremendously after the term, and you may not need it anymore. Maybe your children were young and you needed to make sure that while you know, they were still going to school, if something happened to you and you died, there was money to support the family during that time. But when they become adults, you know, hopefully they'll be financially independent and they won't need that. Or if you have enough money, sure, keep a policy going, whether it's term, whole life, or, you know, somewhere in between, to be able to give more money to the family when you die. But from an incapacity planning standpoint, there's a couple of insurances that I want to make sure you, you really think about having. One of them is health insurance. And obviously, you know, hopefully everyone has health insurance, although we know there, there's a problem with that as well. Because if you're, if you're sick and you need care, your health insurance, it may be expensive, but at least it's going to help pay for the cost of your care and, you know, for your family. So health insurance, I don't really need to go into much. Everybody knows about that. Disability insurance helps defray the cost, um, helps help supplement um, income and replace income if you become incapacitated. So if you're working and all of a sudden you, you're supporting your family and you become incapacitated, how is your family going to live and how are they going to support themselves if you have no income coming in? You could have a life insurance policy, but since you're not dead, the life insurance policy will probably not be helping you. So while you're alive but unable to work, the disability insurance while it's not going to replace 100% of your salary, it can certainly help with supplementing um, income for your family. I'm not an insurance agent. There are different types of disability. Um, I will tell you that I have a disability policy that I got. It, was an, it wasn't a group policy from any employer. It was something that I paid for for the last you know, 25 years myself, so no matter what job I ever have, that policy comes with me, as opposed to the ones you get which are more reasonably priced through work. If you leave your employment, you may not be able to take that disability policy with you, and then you could have no disability insurance or fail to qualify or have to pay prohibitive um, prices to get new disability. So it's something when you're discussing disability with your insurance agent, you should discuss what type of policy makes sense for you. And long-term care, which is something, and I'm, I'll tell you, I'm 51 years old. I've just started a long-term care policy a few months ago. Um, the reason I did it is because the statistics show that chances are at some point I'll end up in a nursing home or requiring um, home health care. So right now it's relatively cheap to buy this policy, and I pay for it every month with the hope that, you know, I'll never use it, but the chances are I probably will at some point. And what sold me on my particular policy is I said, all right, well, if I never use it, you know, I'm spending a lot of money over my lifetime, but it has a small life insurance benefit on mine. So if I never use it, there's a little bit of money that goes to my family at my death. So at least I know that there's something at the end. I'm going to get something out of that policy. But it's something that people in their 50s should really be looking at before it becomes too expensive because I've known people who've used it. My own, my own family has used the long-term care insurance that they have, and it really helps tremendously when you need some care either at home or when you go into a nursing home. And by the way, a long-term care policy does not have to be invoked as a forever um, situation. For instance, if you're in a hospital and 
you are going to be needing care for a period of time, but it's not forever, the long-term care policy can kick in then, and then you can stop the benefit and pause it because you don't need it anymore. So it's definitely something that I would look into. Um, life insurance I talked about a little bit before. Um, you can have long-term care with life insurance riders. Life insurance, if you have a cash value policy, may be helpful during your um, incapacity or disability because then you have some cash that you can borrow against and help pay your bills. So life insurance does come into play a bit, and obviously you've got to get life insurance when you're well, so the earlier you get it, the better. So it is really a good tool for um, planning for incapacity. So you want to you want to integrate your insurance, go through all the different insurances that you should have, and integrate them with whatever planning you're doing. So I, don't, um, I can't tell if there's any questions because I don't see any popping up in my chat box. But again, feel free to email info at assetprotectionattorneys.com for any questions that you have on incapacity planning. It really is essential for everyone, and when I tell you everyone, I mean anyone over the age of 18 who is allowed to sign documents should have the documents we discussed today, with the exception of maybe the revocable trust. They should have the durable power of attorney, the health care surrogate, a living will, a HIPAA, and a declaration naming pre-need guardian. Because there are whether they're in college and they're away from home or, you know, things happen. We really don't, and, you know, as parents, we don't necessarily have control or say over what they're doing. Um, I've seen situations where kids go away to school, they get sick, the parents are home, and they're not able to get any medical, Not they're not able to get any medical conversations going with any of the doctors, they don't get any medical information, it's a major issue. So before any kid leaves for college, you should have these documents. They should name you as health care, power of attorney, everything else that you need because you want to make sure that you're able to take care of their needs even if you can't be with them. So that's what we have for today. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. Next month's webinar is on July 23rd at noon. It's a Thursday as well. Topic is to be determined. Let me know if you have any questions on what we talked about today or if you need a complimentary preliminary consultation. We're always happy to hear from people, always happy for webinar topics if you have any that you want to hear about. Um, you know, we do them once a month. I've been doing them for many, many years. So topics are scarce. I'd love to have feedback. So just let me know. Just email us or call us. And I want to thank you for joining us. If you're not already getting our newsletter, then please make sure that you get on our e-newsletter. And if you are interested in complimentary copies of Mr. Presser's asset protection books are excellent. Please let us know, and we can send those to you as well. So thank you very much, and have a good rest of the day, and stay safe.